the call over so we can hear a word from our sponsor, NCSD's Executive Director, Bill Smith. Thanks, Dana, and good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to briefly thank each of you for joining us today on behalf of uh, all of us here at NCSD and our partners at NASDAD. Um, uh, very briefly, I don't think if you're joining this call that I need to tell you very much about why data sharing is so important. Um, I think from NCSD and NASDAD side of work, um, since the release of the Data Security and Confidentiality Guidelines in 2011 from CDC, really inspired by the PIXI program collaboration and service integration efforts there, we've been trying to, uh, as, as your member organizations, trying to understand and better help uh, and provide assistance around uh, data sharing uh, among our member health departments and often between them. Um, so we're really pleased to pull this call together today. Um, you're going to hear from some really excellent presenters around some of the best practices and challenges in data sharing. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, this presentation myself and hoping to learn uh, a lot. So. Uh, I hope you all enjoy this, and let me also just thank in advance uh, my colleague Dana Cropper-Williams, whom you've already heard from, and Kelly Mayer, who's our Director of Operations and Head of Member Services here at NCSD for pulling together the webinar today. And uh, in advance, I hope all of you have a great holiday. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, Dana. Thanks, Bill. So as Bill said, we're really happy to uh, had this webinar today. It's been a, a project that we've been working on for, for a while. And today we have four speakers that are going to start with providing us an overview of the findings from the survey, followed by their project area experiences with data sharing. I, I want to say right up front, thanks to the many members of NASDAQ and NCSD who completed the survey for us. This is the only way that we got this information and can share it because you provided information and completed the survey, and we want to thank you for doing that. There will be an opportunity after each presenter for a brief Q&A um, via the chat box. So after each presenter, if you have a burning question, feel free to use the chat box, and we will take about two, possibly three questions for that presenter. After the full webinar, you can ask, you know, we'll have a full session of Q&A that you can ask of any presenter that you would like. And we will uh, open the lines at that time. Our speakers today are Dr. Lizzie Taroni. She is the, at the DSTDP Epi and Surveillance Branch. Dr. Kyle Bernstein from San Francisco, the Director of Applied Research Community Health. and Surveillance and Population Health. Wow. And from our project areas, also we have from Wisconsin, Mari Gassiorowitz and Brandon Kufalk, followed by New York City, Robin Hennessy. And we want to give a special thanks to some folks who aren't going to uh, present but had major contributions, and that is Dr. B.W. Furness from CDC and Natalie Kramer from NASDAQ. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lizzie Taroni. Thanks, Dana. Uh, let's see if I can advance the slides appropriately. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lizzie Taroni. Um, as Dana said, I'm on the surveillance team here in the Division of STD Prevention at CDC. Um, this was actually a project I worked on, though, when I was with the Field Epidemiology Unit in the Division. And Bruce Furness, a medical epidemiologist who many of you know, um, who's on the Field Epi team and placed in Washington, D.C., was a key collaborator with me. Um, as Dana said, I'm just going to give some key findings from the survey NCSD and NASDAQ did earlier this year to look at how programs are sharing data to inform and target prevention efforts. So the initial motivation from the survey came from an NCSD meeting a couple of years ago where some members expressed frustration at the barriers they were facing to accessing data in a timely way to target their prevention efforts. And, but we really didn't know how widespread the problem was, so we decided to ask, and we did, through, did so through a survey. So the first objective of the survey was really just to understand and to describe how project areas access data across programs. So can HIV staff access STD data to see if persons known to be infected with HIV are subsequently reported with an STD? 
and can STD staff access HIV data to check the HIV status of persons diagnosed with an STD? And then when we were developing the survey, we realized it wasn't just about accessing data, it was also about using the shared data. So another objective was to describe how project areas use shared data to inform prevention services. And the survey also wanted to identify any barriers to both sharing and using data. Yeah. Yeah. The survey was administered via SurveyMonkey in January of this year. An invitation was sent to all NCSD and NASDAQ members. And I just want to note here that while the initial motivation for the survey came from NCSD members, we quickly realized that NASDAQ members were also really invested in this issue. And so NCSD reached out to NASDAQ early on in the process, and this was sent as a joint survey. HIV and STD managers were asked to complete the survey separately unless the program was fully integrated with only one HIV STD manager. And we did this because we realized that some of the barriers to sharing and using data are really perceived barriers, and we wanted to see if there were differences within project areas. The survey included questions on program integration, database use for surveillance and partner management, data access and use, any barriers, and any technical assistance needed. And since this really was an exploratory survey, the majority of questions had a free text field so folks could write in and explain their responses. Thank you. There was, um, there was a high response rate to this voluntary survey, and I know you all get asked to do a lot of surveys, so we were really glad folks responded. Um, there were 88 respondents, representing 91% of the 65 STD program areas. 33 of the jurisdictions had a respondent from both HIV and STD and or a respondent in a joint um, HIV-STD position. There was a high completion rate, so most people who started the survey finished it, and everyone made use of the free text field, so we had a lot of free text. The conference data. has been muted. The conference has been muted. The conference has been unmuted. Okay, the conference can... has been unmuted. I think we're unmuted. <laughs> um, so we've organized, uh, oops, let me advance here. So I'm going to go through the findings, um, and we've kind of organized the um, data analysis around just key findings. So the first one is that there seems to be some uncertainty around both integration and data access within program areas. So among the 21 program areas that had multiple respondents, 86% gave con conflicting responses about level of program in integration. So, for example, one person in an area said, our HIV and STD surveillance are fully integrated, and another person from the same jurisdiction said, our surveillance programs aren't integrated at all. And 52% of areas with multiple respondents gave discordant responses about data access. And so I do want to note this is only based on 21 jurisdictions, and it may not be representative of everyone, but it is suggestive that there is some uncertainty within programs. The second key finding is that access to data varies by program. So in most jurisdictions, STD staff has access to HIV data. But in 47% of those jurisdictions, the access is indirect. So for example, the DIS has to contact the STA, STD surveillance staff member, who then has to contact the HIV surveillance staff member, then it has to trickle back down to the DIS. So it's access to the data, but it's not really timely access. In most jurisdictions, HIV staff has access to STD data. But unlike the STD staff's access, in 72% of project areas, the access is direct, meaning the HIV staff can directly query the STD database, and that can make data sharing more timely. So the third key finding, um, folks are using their shared data to target their prevention efforts. So more than half of the jurisdictions that can check the HIV status of persons with STDs use that data to guide case management and partner services. So for example, they use the HIV status to decide which cases to prioritize for interview or to change the interview period. More than half of the jurisdictions that check if persons known to be infected with HIV are subsequently reported with an STD use that data to target their HIV prevention services. So for example, that triggers a re-interview, or the STD diagnosis um, may trigger a check to make sure those um, folks that are HIV positive are linked to HIV care. And finally, key finding number four, help is needed. So there were some barriers reported. Um, reported barriers to sharing and using data included um, access, e access issues, so data sharing may be illegal in some jurisdictions, or the program may not have the appropriate data sharing policies in place yet. 
Some jurisdictions have database issues, meaning they just can't get their databases to talk to each other. And then jurisdictions also reported resource issues. So areas may not have enough staff to do the data linkage. So for some folks it's really time intensive and they just don't have the um, staff to do it. Or they don't have the staff to actually perform the prevention service, um, so they can't do partner services on all the people they would like to target. There was some specific technical assistance requested, including help in developing and or transitioning to database systems with the ability to share data. Technical assistance was also requested for funding to integrate data systems, as well as examples of best practices for using data for prevention. And it's really that last technical assistance request listed there that prompted the webinar today, which will highlight three programs that are sharing and using their data. So I just want to acknowledge and thank the folks listed here from NCSD, NASDAQ, and CDC who worked on the survey, as well as all of you on the call who actually took the survey as Dana and Bill said, we really appreciate um, you participating in this, and we wouldn't have these data, and this webinar probably wouldn't be happening if you all hadn't taken the survey. Um, so with that, um, I'm happy to answer any clarification questions and or answer more during the discussion. And if you want to talk to me after the webinar, please feel free to email or call me directly. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you, Lizzie, for that great overview that really shows the work that went into um, the survey and also the data analysis that you did. So thank you so much. I don't see any questions that have come into the chat box. So please, if you do have questions, you can put them forward and we will get them at the close of all the presenters. I want to remind you to please put your phones on mute. Our next presenter is Dr. Kyle Bernstein from San Francisco. Kyle? Thanks, Dana. Let me see if I can now. Perfect. Um, thanks, Dana. My name is Kyle Bernstein. I'm with the San Francisco Department of Public Health. And while we're currently in, um, in the midst of a reorganization which is better aligning our HIV and STD programs, I wanted to talk about um, a project that we uh, developed to sort of better utilize data from HIV surveillance in our HIV partner services program. And this was started before our reorganization happened locally. So to provide some context, uh, this is a graph which shows new HIV diagnoses and STD diagnoses in San Francisco from 2006 through 2012. The purple dotted line is chlamydia, the green dotted line is gonorrhea, the red dotted line is early syphilis, and the blue solid line is new HIV diagnoses. If we look at these data um, solely among men who have sex with men, we'll see um, that for the three bacterial STDs, there's been a trend towards increasing morbidity while our HIV infections have been somewhat stable. Um, in San Francisco, it's estimated that the HIV prevalence among men who have sex with men is about 25%, which has huge implications for our HIV partner services program, given that a lot of named partners are likely persons who have been uh, and, and know that they're HIV infected, and we spend a fair amount of time uh, running around the city trying to find these people just to find out that they're HIV infected. And I'll come back to this in a second. In, in the response to um, our HIV epidemic locally, we developed about four years ago the LINCS program. And LINCS stands for Linkage, Integration, Navigation, Comprehensive Services. And this is really a whole catalog of services the health department offers from testing to what I call retreatment. So as you can see here at the bottom, uh, the program covers HIV testing, disclosure, linkage to care, HIV partner services, as well as navigation and re-engagement to care for folks who have fallen out of HIV care. This was a collaboration between the STD HIV prevention and HIV surveillance programs locally. And I think one of the interesting components of this program was that for community-based organizations that were competing for um, RFPs with the city, they were required as part of this RFP process to agree that they were going to support all activities of the LINCS program, including HIV partner services and uh, navigation. So these community-based organizations which we've worked with for many years here, some of which were not entirely bought onto the idea of partner services, 
were told up front that in order to receive resources through this contract that they were going to have to support these activities. So briefly, um, what is HIV Partner Services? Um, HIV Partner Services is uh, uh, activities that help assist HIV-infected persons um, notify partners that they may have exposed to HIV. Um, we know that some index patients are unable or unwilling to notify their partners personally, and this is an opportunity for uh, confidential partner notification, which um, will hopefully help people get better access to their current HIV results and in turn quicker access to meds and reduction in viral loads, which will hopefully have an impact on citywide morbidity. So the way that this works generally is that index patients are asked to provide the names and contact information for all their recent sex and needle sharing partners. And then staff from the health department confidentially notifies the partners about their exposure and helps them get HIV tested um, without violating the index patient's confidentiality by naming them back. This next slide is, is a schematic of sort of the ideal situation. We have um, the male partner A at the top who is recently diagnosed with HIV. We offer them a range of supportive services as well as partner elicitation. And then we hope to find those partners. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, in San Francisco, we have a, a fairly high prevalence of HIV among the MSM community, and a large amount of our new diagnoses are among MSM and transgender persons. So the ability to identify named partners who may have already been reported with HIV is, is an important component of reducing or increasing the efficiency of our partner services program by allowing us to spend more time on folks whose status we're unaware of and less time on folks we know who are HIV infected and have been reported to HIV surveillance. So the challenge here is that in, as in San Francisco, as many places, we have two parallel data systems. ISHTAR um, is a locally developed STD clinical metal, medical record system, which also includes all countywide STD case reporting, as well as the partner services for HIV and syphilis case management. On the right here, we have EHARS, which is a CDC-developed uh, system that is currently state-controlled in California. California has three project areas, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and then the remainder of the state. And the state of California's Office of AIDS is the responsible party for maintaining the HARS system. While we have a locally accessed and maintained system, we don't have the authority to make significant changes or um, dictate necessarily how the data is utilized. Um, across the state. And HIV case reports come into the EHAR system. The challenge that we have is that these two systems are separate and are not connected. I'm going to spend a little bit of time now talking about how we've developed sort of a workaround in San Francisco to, to basically get access to data that's in EHARs without having direct access to EHARs. So in both of our systems, ISHTAR and EHARS, we do get positive HIV test results. EHARS is the case reporting system for the county, so all, case, all new diagnoses are reported into the EHAR system. And then in ISHTAR, we have imports from our public health lab, as well as case reports for persons who need a partner services case management um, event initiated. What we wanted was to be able to get data from EHARS into ISHTAR across this red barrier, which is what's keeping the two systems separate. We know that the HIV partner services interview and partner elicitation data is kept in ISHTAR, but we want to be able to check the names of named partners in EHARS to determine whether or not they're a known positive. We could dispo that case and then deprioritize them for further follow-up. What we're going to talk about here is the process that we utilize to, to allow our DIS staff who do HIV partner services to get access to information that's kept in EHARs about, known, or about named partners. So the way that this works is in ISHTAR, we've created a, a view, which is basically a data set um, of SQL tables that populate into an access table that lists all the open named HIV partner services partners that have been initiated by our DIS. 
We then share this access table um, with staff in HIV surveillance through a secure network connection. The staff in HIV surveillance have access to this file. They can open it and it live updates um, as soon as the file is opened. And then uh, at least once a week, HIV surveillance staff do a record search in EHARS of all of the folks on this access data, data table and assign a disposition to the partners in that table as either in EHARS yes, in EHARS no, or blank. So we know not only are they in EHARS, but we also know if the record search was conducted and the person is not in EHARS. The results of that access table are then read back into Ishtar, and in Ishtar the dispositions are automatically updated based on the results of the EHARS search. So if we have an index patient who named three partners, and one of those partners was found in the EHARS search, that partner would be dispositioned as a previous positive and deprioritized in terms of follow-up for a partner services activity. The DIS then use these data to, to uh, follow up and complete all investigations of indexes and named partners. So we began this in November of 2011 and I looked at data through September of 2013. We had about 5,200 named partners during that period for an HIV um, index patient. Of those, 2,497 or 47% were dispositioned as a previously infected HIV, uh, as previously infected with HIV. And of those, we were able to search 251 partners through EHARS and identified 50 as previously positive. So these were 50 partners that we didn't necessarily have to work as hard or as quickly in order to determine their HIV status. In terms of the impact of this program, so we've been able to develop a collaborative protocol for improved efficiency of HIV partner services, and we've been able to implement and evaluate this um, pilot project. I think importantly, as a group, the HIV and STD surveillance and program staff were able to come together to overcome barriers to sharing and disparate surveillance platforms. We've also been able to collaborate and develop a solution-oriented leadership framework around LINCS activities, which has improved the trust and shared accountability across the HIV and STD programs. It's important to keep in mind that in San Francisco, we're in the process of developing an integrated MAVEN-based surveillance system where the HIV and syphilis partner services data will reside, and hopefully in the future, some of these uh, barriers to sharing data will be overcome based on our new surveillance platform. But I think it's important to note that just having the capabilities to uh, look in each other's computer systems is just part of it, and developing the, the trust, um, shared accountability, and uh, protocols for these activities across HIV and STD programs are really critical to a successful collaboration. I want to just take a minute to thank uh, folks here in San Francisco, particularly Mary Kay Parisi, um, Viva Delgado, and Charles Fan, who are really the, the, the folks who have really take, done the heavy lifting on this project, Erin oh. Antunes, who is our navigator here in San Francisco, um, Tracy Packer, Susan Shear, Ling Su, and Susan Phillip have also all been very critically involved in the development of this program, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kyle. That was great and really serves as a good example for folks who are looking for a sort of workaround as they gain fuller access. Thank you so much. Um, I ask that you please continue to keep your phones on mute. We do hear a little bit of background noise, and unfortunately, we have some difficulty muting all the lines. So please keep your phones on mute for us. All right. Okay, one question has come through. How, and um, Kyle, this question is for you. Okay. How long does it usually take for HIV staff search EHARS and to provide and provide HIV status on named partners? So how long does it take for your HIV staff to search EHARS and to provide HIV status on the partners? It's, um, so I, that's a good question. So the, the HIV surveillance staff agreed that they would search at least once a week. They're usually searching twice a week. 
Um, the list is not that long, so it actually doesn't take very long. The estimates that I've gotten from the staff are that on each of the days that they do the search, it takes between five and ten minutes. So it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty quick turnaround. And we felt like this was a much more reasonable approach to trying to get this information than having the DIS call a central person in HIV surveillance who would um, potentially be answering the phone constantly throughout the day. So this was a way that we felt we could get the data in a sort of timely fashion that wouldn't be too burdensome to the staff in HIV surveillance. Great, thank you. All right, so our next presenters are from Wisconsin. Okay, one more question has come through. Kyle, once again, this question is for you. Folks, please remember to put your phones on mute. Did, so Kyle, did you check on the viral load of those named HIV partners to see if they were out of care and newly infected or newly infected persons? That's a, um, that's a good question. So we are currently in the process of integrating some of these activities into our navigation component. So trying to utilize surveillance data and partner services data to identify folks who may not need partner services but would benefit from getting either linkage to care or a re-engagement to care. So we're currently in the process of figuring out how to best utilize these data in that fashion and be in compliance with all of our local, state, and federal rules around data sharing. So we're currently not doing that, but it's something that we're in the process of addressing. Great, Kyle. Thank you. Okay, so moving along, we're going to go to our next speakers. We have two speakers from the state of Wisconsin. They are Mari Gassiorowitz and Brandon Kufalk. Thank you, Dave. Dana for inviting us um, to this presentation. Um, my name is Brandon Kufalk. I'm an STD public health advisor for the state of Wisconsin STD program. I'm here with Mari Gasorowitz, an epidemiologist in the Wisconsin AIDS HIV program, and today we'll be presenting on collaboration and data sharing between the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, AIDS, HIV, and STD programs. However, before we begin, I would like to thank O.T. and Darlene, who are federal assignees in the Milwaukee office, for helping us with the development of the content in this webinar. First, what we would like to do is provide a context of STDs and HIV in Wisconsin and Milwaukee. Then, we'll show some slides that present not only HIV and STD data together, but give a concrete example of how our data sharing activities have benefited both programs. Finally, we'll talk about our existing and upcoming data sharing activities. So let's take a look at what's going on for STD and HIV in Wisconsin and Milwaukee. By way of context, most of Wisconsin STD rates are fairly low. But of the 51 largest cities in the nation, Milwaukee has the third highest rates of both chlamydia and gonorrhea. Mm. Percentages of STDs are fairly similar around the country. Chlamydia accounts for more than 80% of reportable STDs in Wisconsin, gonorrhea for another 17%, and syphilis for just 1%. When it comes to co-infection of STDs and HIV, how each program perceives co-infection can be different. For instance, in Milwaukee County, which accounts for a majority of the state's syphilis cases and half of the state's recent HIV diagnoses. On the left, you see a large percentage of primary and secondary syphilis cases, 43%, were HIV infected at the time of syphilis diagnosis. By contrast, on the right, you see only 3% of new HIV cases had a primary or secondary syphilis diagnosis at the time of HIV diagnosis. Now, Mari will tell us something about some of the things regarding HIV. So, uh, well, Milwaukee has very high um, chlamydia and gonorrhea rates, as uh, Brandon just showed us. 
compared to other cities, uh, HIV diagnoses rates are rather low. You can see we're sort of in the bottom quintile there in the red. Um, so this sl slide shows uh, diagnoses by estimated risk exposure by race ethnicity in Milwaukee, uh, diagnoses in 2012. And you can see that the largest number of new diagnoses was in black men who sex with men, um, which is the group really most impacted by HIV in Milwaukee and, of course, the rest of the nation. So we estimate that 27% of black MSM in Wisconsin are HIV positive, which is consistent with um, a recent study, actually, of uh, David Holtgraves nationally. Uh, diagnoses in young black MSM tripled in Milwaukee from 20. 2003 to 20, uh, 2010, and the median age of diagnosis in, young, in black MSM was age 23, much younger than uh, in other demographic groups. Um, in terms of sort of summary of the various diseases, so HIV is, uh, Wisconsin's a low incidence state, relatively low incidence in Milwaukee actually, um, and trends in diagnoses in young black MSM in Milwaukee really drive trends in the state's epidemic. Of all, in terms of all populations. So STDs were a low incidence state, um, but very high incidence in Milwaukee for both chlamydia and gonorrhea, moderate incidence for syphilis in Milwaukee and statewide. And then co-infections are low for syphilis, uh, HIV with syphilis, um, hepatitis C, and TB. So this slide shows some context for the AIDS, HIV, and STD programs and are working together. So this is sort of two pieces. The top part is an organizational chart, and you can see that STD and HIV are in the same bureau. We're also on the same right. floor at the health department, um, you know, so we I can walk across the hall and be in Brandon's office. Okay. Uh, so here we're gonna I'm gonna show you three examples of um, sort of presenting data together. Um, so the first is uh, a report that we, the Department of Health Services releases that we prepare jointly with the Department of Public Instruction, our education department, that looks at uh, youth risk sexual behaviors and outcomes. So it includes YRBS or Youth Risk Behavior Survey data, uh, and then data on STDs, HIV, and birth to teens, you know, STD and HIV data in youth. Uh, and there's a link at the bottom of the slide, or I'll just promote our, um, you can either go to our uh, HIV data and statistics site, or we also have a Wisconsin LGBT health website, which you can easily Google, and there in the reports section are a bunch of cool reports, including this one, so a little promotional piece. There's more types of scans. Okay, the second one is uh, <coughs> we conducted an epi aid in conjunction with CDC in 2009, and Lizzie Taroni worked on that. Um, so regarding high and increasing rates of HIV in young black MSM in Milwaukee, and the findings were published in an MMWR in February of 2011. So just recently we thought we would go back and update some of the analysis now that uh, the interventions that were developed as a result of the epi aid have been in place uh, for a few years. So this next set of slides kind of build on each other and show data about young black MSM in Milwaukee from multiple data sources. So on this slide we can see that the number of HIV tests um, among in young black MSM uh, conducted in publicly funded counseling and testing sites doubled between 2009 and 2012, from about 300 to about 600. So that's the right-hand axis that you see there. And then uh, we've added here in the blue both HIV diagnoses and new positives from public test sites. Um, so first of all, you can see that that dotted line, that about half of our positives in this population come from public sites. Uh, and secondly, you can see that both of those have gone down between 2010 and 2012. Um, in fact, diagnoses down by about 50%, and those, those numbers are on the left-hand axis. And I know that our numbers are smaller than Okay, next one. Um, so, and then we've added here in the red new uh, syphilis diagnoses, co-infected with HIV in the same population. And those increased between 2009 and 2012, but the numbers are really um, pretty small, as you can see on the left-hand axis. Uh, so this slide, which is showing the increase in tests and at the same time the decline in diagnoses, um, has spurred a lot of discussion at various, I think three or four now, community meetings. And so the question is really, you know, is that decline in diagnoses representative of, does it reflect a decline in transmission or 
you know, are there pockets of people that we're just completely missing in terms of, um, yeah, yeah, you know, they're not coming into the test else. sites, we're not yeah. finding them through social networks testing and so on, and if so, how can we reach them? I mean, if they were to live beyond 50, um, that's so that's a, you know, a question we're wrestling with. We're obviously following this closely and, um, you know, we'll see, we don't want to jump to conclusions, but we're hopeful that there's a, a, a trend in the right direction. Then the third example here is uh, in 2011 and 2012, Milwaukee had an HIV syphilis cluster, um, young black MSM. And we used this figure at uh, a couple of community meetings, with a meeting with providers and then a community meeting sort of as a catalyst for discussion. So you can see that in the next case and then there is co-infected um, or uh, HIV syphilis or negative and unknown status. And this is, so people like this. Diagram. Now, the only thing I've seen so. is Brandon? And is that Finally, uh, we will address data systems uh, and data sharing activities between the STD and HIV program. Now, the STD program uses WES, the Wisconsin Electronic Disease Surveillance System, which is the Wisconsin version of NEDS for STD surveillance. While WES has ELR, Electronic Laboratory Reporting, capabilities, it has not been perfected for case management. Therefore, the City of Milwaukee Health Department also uses STDMIS for case management activity. Like every other state, the AIDS HIV program uses EHARS for HIV surveillance. We also use Partner Services Web for managing Partner Services activities. CS Web and Evaluation Web are both products of Luther Consulting. Currently, we check for co-infection and have two-way data sharing of HIV with syphilis, hepatitis C, and TB. There is HIV testing at three STD clinics in Milwaukee, but not all clinics statewide. And nearly all, over 98%, of syphilis cases are documented as having been tested for HIV. We also share resources. The City of Milwaukee Health Department Disease Intervention Specialists conduct follow-up or partner services for both HIV and syphilis. The STD Control Section provides the, ma the major funding for DIS in Milwaukee. However, the AIDS HIV program also provides a significant portion of funding for these joint DIS. Wisconsin is in the middle of a large SPINS linkage to care project. One of the linkage to care specialists is located at the city's main STD clinic to facilitate successful referrals. A Milwaukee DIS conducts counseling and testing for every half day every week at a large community-based organization in Milwaukee. And finally, the program benefits from expertise that staff from each program brings in terms of data analysis, policy analysis, and relationships with local agencies. We have had some success, but there's still much work to be done. Our next effort will be to expand beyond looking at co-infection of HIV and syphilis to looking at co-infection of HIV and rectal gonorrhea. We plan to download data from the two sur separate surveillance systems, develop SAS code to match on name, date of birth, and several additional variables in order to identify co-infection. We will then update both databases with the information. We'll include the aggregate data in the EPA profiles and expand dissemination of the data. We look forward to learning from our colleagues about additional activities regarding data sharing between HIV and STD programs. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Great. Thanks. Mari, and thank you, Brandon. Uh, great examples for us. We really appreciate it. Was someone about to say something? I recognize that some of our presenters are in areas where you hear some background noise, but if you are not presenting or if you are on the line as a participant, please mute your line. Okay, our last presenter is Robin Tennessee from the from New York City. Robin, hello, I'm here. Um, 
and thank you for inviting me. Um, I have to apologize. I have um, very little voice today. And also there's some technical difficulties in that I cannot um, forward my own slides. And in fact, I don't even see them up on the screen at the moment. So I'm assuming that you have my first slide, which is syphilis and HIV in NYC. Yes? We do, and I'll be happy to um, move your slides for you. Okay, great. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how the STD um, and HIV program shared some data to um, try to guide our disease intervention activities. So next slide. Um, in the past, New York City um, has had some issues sharing data like everyone else. Um, there were um, very restrictive state laws. Um, our um, STD and HIV bureaus were completely separate. Actually, they still are separate, um, but um, that made them somewhat territorial. Um, we would do some cross matches um, between the STDs and HIV registries, um, and they were for evaluation purposes and program planning, but not very timely, and we couldn't really make too many um, decisions based on that. And we did have the opportunity for STD staff to call HIV staff to check on the HIV status of partners to HIV cases only. And this is actually similar to what Kyle was talking about, but it was a um, manual process where they were calling on a regular basis. Pretty cumbersome. Next slide. So luckily we've had some um, changes in recently. Um, our HIV law changed in 2010, <clears throat> which allowed for um, STD staff and other staff in the agency to have some access <clears throat> to the registry to be able to look up not just partners but original patients. Additionally, our restrictive STD law changed in 2013, and so now we will also be able to give folks um, access to um, the STD registry. And so here we are. Now we can share some data, so what should we do about that? Next slide. Uh, this just gives you um, an indication of um, our volume in New York City. Um, we have almost 1,000 cases of primary and secondary syphilis in 2013. Um, and as following most trends, most of them are um, male. Our median age of cases is 31. Um, most of our cases are MSM, and um, a large proportion of those are HIV positive. Next slide. We also have a f high volume of syphilis activities in New York City. Um, I'm just going to give you a sample month of May 2013. We had 14,000 um, syphilis tests received from our electronic lab reporting. Um, 11,000 of those were reactive tests. And yes, this includes some duplicates and confirmatory tests and some negative tests, but you get a sense that we have a high volume. Additionally, during that same month, um, we had close to 1,000 syphilis field investigations. Most of them were based off reactive tests, but some were um, partners. And of those field investigations, 1,000 of them were primary and secondary cases. Next. So like any other health department, um, we suffer from low resources, but we also have high volume, so we need to prioritize. And we have a fair, you know, few tools that we use to prioritize these activities. And I'm sure a syphilis reactor grid is familiar to most folks um, out there. But just in case, um, it's something where, um, based on our local epidemiology and age and gender and titers, we decide who will um, get follow-up and who will not. Additionally, um, in our registry, we use MAVEN here in New York City for STD surveillance. Um, we're able to um, direct the incoming test results based on priority. So we have um, a high titer priority workflow. We have a pregnant woman workflow. Um, we have an automatic closure for low priority cases. Um, and additionally, we have a workflow for something called the Private Case Investigation Unit, which is a set of priority providers that you know, are based on volume. They um, are diagnosing the most cases. 
And we evaluate this list on a pretty regular basis, and it's a separate workflow. So we're able to focus activities there. Next slide. So now we're talking about um, STD and HIV co-infection. And you know, CDC is pretty as asking us now more and more to look at co-infection for prioritizing. I mean, and those of us who just finished our um, application for the grant, they ask us um, to, to um, pay more attention to HIV status when doing partner services for STD patients. So we've decided, we, we were wondering, should HIV positivity be considered at all when prioritizing patients for syphilis field activities? And we really didn't know how many of those with incoming reactive tests were HIV positive. We know how many of our cases are HIV positive, but not how many of our incoming tests. So that led us to um, the data that we're going to um, present right now. <clears throat> so next slide. The first thing we had to do is that our STD staff had to be um, receive the HIV confidentiality training. They had to receive HARS training, access to HARS, and in order to get access to HARS, um, folks have to log off of their regular network and log on to a separate network. Um, and so there's still a bit of a barrier there, even though um, it's better than calling. Um, and we had to add a few new variables in our Maven and. Um, data collection tool was developed, and then we had an analytic database. Next slide. So what we did was for one month, all incoming syphilis tests that came to our priority workflow were investigated and, um, excuse me, were evaluated and initiated for field follow-up services using regular um, protocols. But what we did differently was we researched in MAVEN, which is again the STD registry, to see if we had any past evidence of HIV infection. For those that were not, we had no evidence, we then went to HARS to check to see if um, the patient was HIV positive. Next. So this is my results slide. <clears throat> Actually, this is a, a little bit more of the um, process slide. So for December 2012, we again looked at all of the patients that came through our priority case investigation unit, and it turned out it was 675 patients for that month. We asked, do they meet current um, criteria for field investigation? And they could be either yes or no. And regardless of whether they met field definition, we checked to see were they HIV positive in MAVEN. If they were, then that was the end of the evaluation. If they were not, we then went to the HIV registry, HARS, to see if the, if the patient was positive. Next slide. So here are the results. As you can tell, only 11% or 74 of the 675 patients actually meet our current criteria for field follow-up. And the majority, almost 90%, do not actually meet um, criteria for follow-up, and that could be because they were recently treated, um, low titers, et cetera, et cetera, um, but they don't meet criteria. So we then checked to see were they positive in MAVEN, and we found that 33% um, or 223 out of this um, month of patients were already positive in our system. We, we knew about them. But that also meant that there were 452 that we did not know um, if they were positive. And so we did 452 um, checks in the HARS registry where we found another 163 positive patients. So overall, 57% of reactors during that one month were HIV positive. And, um, it's worth noting that those who were positive, the median age was 41, whereas when we talked earlier about our cases, our syphilis cases, the median age is 31. Next slide. So as I said, 11% met current criteria for field follow-up. And of those, nearly 70% were HIV positive, and we knew um, 32% of those from our current system, and then we learned that 37% were from the HARS check. 
Next slide. So the potential impact of this is, you know, we're not really sure what we were expecting um, to find, and um, we already have a high volume of syphilis activities, so we, we weren't sure whether we would be able to um, use HIV as a criteria. However, if we did use HIV positivity as a potential um, prioritizing tool, um, we would have to do 452 HARS checks just for the folks coming through um, this priority case unit per month. And then an additional 335 patients could potentially be um, considered for field follow-up. Um, and given our current resources, we absolutely would not be able to handle this. So um, having this data available t to us let us now know that we would really not be able to, um, to make a differences in our program strategy currently. Next slide. But what we did decide that we could do is um, rather than check HIV status for all incoming reactors, we decided that we would check HIV status in HARS for all patients that we were already initiating for field follow-up to determine um, before they got out into the field whether or not the patient was HIV positive. And that brought us down to about 50 HARS checks a month um, and was much more feasible. Additionally, it alleviated the field staff's need to check HARS and allows them to prioritize their work. Next slide. Um, additional benefits were that you know, we were able to find um, demographic information from HARS and put it into our STD registry. This helped us to have more complete data and better deduplication. Next slide. So what are our next steps? Um, well, we would like to con conduct some similar assessments. Um, currently, this, this project was looking at priority case investigation unit patients, and so we, we, we kind of expected the numbers to be pretty high. Um, so we might try a different set. We also might want to look at this with gonorrhea patients and see what the load would be there. Um, so we might consider actually making harsh checks routine for, um, for all syphilis investigations before going out. Additionally, we've been able to provide um, HIV staff with access to our registry. And we are hoping and working towards implementing a real-time automated match so that there will be no need for checking um, manually and that we would be able to have this information up front while making decisions. So next slide. Um, finally, there's always the, the challenges slide. Um, it took several years of work to change the HIV and STD laws. Um, you know, it was easy for me to say, oh yeah, they were changed, but that took many, many persistent, persistent years to do that. Um, we also have limited um, IT resources and competing priorities are delaying that real-time automation. Um, the current system of having direct access to HARS um, does make an improvement, but it's still burdensome in that um, STD staff still have to log on to a separate network. Um, I will take this um, opportunity, though, to plug um, PIXI, the Program Collaboration and Service Integration here in New York City, because they have actually gone a long way towards um, assisting all of our various programs in um, in coming up with opportunities for data sharing and working towards a lot of the trust that Kyle was actually talking about earlier for data sharing and coming up with um, you know, guidelines and pieces of information that we would all be interested in um, sharing. Next slide. So finally, I just wanted to thank the Bureau of HIV for actually allowing us to get into their data. Um, Sring Shodan, who um, managed the majority of this data collection, um, Ellen Klingler, Rosa Leggett, who did all the HARS checks, and Julie and Sue, who um, supervise and provide all the cheerleading. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. All right, so we just heard from all of our presenters, excellent presenters, talking about what is going on in their project areas. Hopefully you got some good information on ways that you could 
if you don't already have full access to all to your all your data, ways that you can gain greater access so that can impact your quality of work. Um, questions, anyone who has a question, you can unmute your phone using star seven. Have a question for any of the presenters. Also, if you would like to put your uh, question in on the chat box, that would be fine as well. What questions do you have? I find it hard to believe we don't have any questions. I actually have a question for New York. Um, when you're talking about syphilis reactors, are you talking just about having a, for instance, a reactive RPR and not having a confirmatory test? Or are you talking having about both a reactive treponemal and a reactive non-treponemal test at the same time as being a reactor? Um, I was referring to any reactive syphilis test. Which is, which is why my unit ended up being um, 675 individual patients with a reactive test as opposed to the individual tests. Great, thank you. Oh, hey, Go ahead. Hey, hey, this is Lizzie. I actually have a question for folks on the phone. Um, I know from looking at the results of the survey that there are some people who are doing this type of match for gonorrhea. Um, I know we heard a lot about HIV and syphilis today. I wonder if there's anyone on the call today who is matching their gonorrhea data and using that information for their program, and if they'd be willing to share a little bit about that just briefly. Hi, Lizzie. It's Kyle. Um, Hi, Kyle. We in San Francisco do match um, our STD morbidity with our HIV morbidity, but it's not in real time. It's um, periodically. We're up to, I think, twice a year now we do it. And we utilize that for epidemiologic investigations and, and sort of data analysis, but we haven't been able to do a real time match where we're using that data to maybe prioritize gonorrhea investigations in certain populations. That's the same story here in New York City. I mean, we've definitely matched gonorrhea cases to our HIV registry um, and, and learned proportions co-infected, um, but we have not yet been able to um, do anything with that. Our plans are to move forward doing that, though. Other questions for any of the presenters? And feel free to put it in the chat box if you are shy. This is Bruce Furness in DC as a follow-up to Lizzie's question. We are prioritizing um, incident STDs and prevalent HIV cases for HIV partner services. And we have a gonorrhea and chlamydia reactor grid, and we do have rectal gonorrhea positive rectal gonorrhea on that as being one of the criteria that would pull you in to being investigated, but we're having difficulty getting site of infection on lab reports and case reports. Thanks, Dr. Finesse. Others? If there aren't other questions or comments for the presenters, I'd like to thank you all. You see a list of contact information uh, for anyone who's presented, and if you wanted more information about uh, what, any information about what, what, what has happened on this webinar, please feel free to give us a call. The recordings will be available on both the NASDAQ and NCSD websites. Thank you so much for your participation, and thanks to our great presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.